have your Bibles this evening, turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, really be looking primarily in Acts chapter 5 uh, this evening. We've been in chapter 4 for quite a bit, and there are two verses at the end that tie in better with the beginning of chapter 5 and what we'll be addressing tonight, so we're going to lump them in uh, here tonight. Acts chapter 4, looking at verses 36 and 37, and into chapter 5, all the way down to verse 11. So taking a little bit of a, a bigger portion of scripture this evening, and we have been really tracking a lot of the movements of the early church, a lot of things that have been happening. We've seen some crossroads that we've approached, uh, that the early church had to face as they were beginning um, in these early infant stages of the church that uh, we've been tracking through in the first four chapters. Uh, one of the first major crossroads that we looked at was the introduction of persecution. There was introduction of persecution that was placed upon Peter and John uh, for their preaching of the gospel and for the healing of the lame man at the temple. Uh, and as Peter and John were persecuted in prison, then later commanded to no longer speak or teach in the name of Jesus. They went back to the church, at this point numbering several thousand after a couple of sermons from Peter that where the Lord had moved and several thousand had trusted Christ as their Savior. He goes back to these believers and as a result of the news shared with them that they would no longer be able to teach and preach in the name of Jesus according to the, um, the command of the religious leaders of the day, a intense prayer meeting broke out. The first thing that they decided to do upon hearing this news was not to hold meetings. It was not to vote on something. It was not to fraction off into different groups, but rather it was to unite and to pray and to ask wisdom and guidance from the Almighty. Uh, so this was really the first crossroads of what was going to happen based on this introduction of persecution. Would Peter and John fold? We see that they didn't fold, rather they were bold. What would happen in the early church? Would it fracture and split and die out? Or would it unite? We see that it united. But then we see the crossroads of the reaction. Because whereas it could have fractured there before they, they prayed together, there was still potential for things to go wrong after they prayed together. They still had to make a decision. They still had to be unified. They still had to carry out the action after this prayer meeting because the prayer meeting didn't change the fact that the command was still there from the religious leaders to no longer preach or teach in Jesus' name. The threat was still there. They still had to act accordingly and act uh, appropriately to what had been done and also what Christ had instructed them to do. So that really was the choice. The choice was either do we obey the religious leaders or do we obey, obey Christ? And it was unanimous among the people that they were going to continue what they were already doing, which was exactly what the Lord commanded them to do. They were going to continue to teach in the name of Christ, they were going to continue to preach Christ, and they were going to continue <coughs> healing and doing everything that they could for the name of Christ. So as they continued, and as they had made this unanimous decision that they were going to keep pushing forward despite the threats of persecution, the early church has several key attitudes that we looked at last week in which are really necessary among the church, but again, are attitudes that should be emulated by the church today, and unfortunately, many times, uh, they are not, and they are actually pushed to the back and sometimes even completely gone against. Uh, but these early attitudes we looked at were, first of all, unity. There was unity within the early church. Chapter 4, verse 32 says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. They were unified as a group of believers. Again, many churches today are not as unified um, as they should be, uh, and even... Christianity as a whole is not unified as it could be and should be um, as the not only the local body of believers, but the collective body of believers that makes up the church. We also see great humility in the early church. And we continue in verse 32. 
and said, Neither said any of them that ought of things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Just in any ver a variety of a group of people, there are people that bring different talents to the table. There are people that have different stages of life and different financial success or different financial um, situations and, and their differences among the church. And this is something that is necessary among the church. The church needs to be a group, a, a variety. Christ intended it to be that way. If you look in some of Paul's epistles, it's described as a body and how the different parts work together for the, for the goal of Christ. But with the differences within the church, there could be a lot of cause of envy. There could be a lot of cause of jealousy. There could be a lot of cause of pride and selfishness. But yet the church was humble. They didn't view themselves as greater than any of the other people, even though one group may have had more money than the other, one group may have had more talent than the other, one group may have still been working while others may have been retired or not even started working yet. The, the things that oftentimes separate us and cause pride to creep in, the early church didn't take that attitude, but rather they were humble. They had all things in common. They also had grace and power within the early church. Verse 33 says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. This was a, a what was happening in the early church. The apostles had great power as they continued to preach and teach that the Lord had given them, and there was great grace among the people. Not only grace in, within the congregation, but also grace within unbelievers outside the congregation. Because they were of one accord, because of their humility, because of their love for each other, people on outside of the church saw this attitude, and they were favorable, because that grace can also mean favor in verse 33. We also looked at how it was a giving church. Um, along with humility comes the giving aspect in verse 34. It says, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. So they were giving. Those who had extra, those who had um, potentially more wealth or more resources, used those resources for the Lord. If they had extra houses, they had extra land, they had extra possessions, they would sell those and bring the proceeds of that to the apostles for the apostles to distribute. So they were giving. And along with their giving, they were also very generous. And we see this in verses 34 and 35. because It says, Neither was there any of them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land and houses sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according to as he had need. So it wasn't that they were just giving and giving a little bit, but rather they were giving quite a bit as they brought the prices of the things that were sold to the uh, apostles for them to distribute among the people. So whatever they brought in, they gave right back. Um, and we're going to see a little bit about that this evening as we continue looking at um, some events in the early church. But this, these were many attitudes that were had within that church. These were key fundamental aspects that were building a foundation for the church to continue to build off of. But unfortunately, as in many churches today and as were bound to happen, there were unfortunately imposters among the congregation. With the congregation numbering several thousand um, and this really becoming almost like a social movement when you think about the amount of people that have been saved in a short period of time, there were no doubt to be some that were just merely following what everyone else was doing. There were those that would be following the latest fad, the latest trend. And at this point, the trend or fad, you can make an argument, was Christianity. That, again, several thousand people are now unified under the name of Christ, and there were some that were probably there because their neighbors were there. Or they were there because they knew someone influential was there. And there were people that were just going through the motions, just following along, not truly meaning or understanding what exactly was taking place. 
So we're going to see this evening what happened in the church, the exposing of the imposters, and the purpose of this exposing. So let's first look at what was happening in the church. So if you want to keep an outline, keep notes of an outline, the first point is what was happening in the church? What was currently happening? And we see this in verses 36 and 37 of chapter 4. And again, this is playing off of what we've just been talking about. But in verse 36, it says, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So again, we're looking at, just as we did a couple weeks ago, the church was growing. There were needs among the people. And as the church was unified, as the church was humble and generous and giving, they helped each other out. And they did this by, again, giving financially to the apostles who would then distribute among the people. And the way many of the people gave were exactly as Barnabas did, in which he had land and he sold it. And he brought the proceeds, again, to the apostles. And this was the example that is given to us, the example of Barnabas. And we could take the time to really dig into Barnabas a little bit more, but that really isn't the purpose of this point or the message this evening. But we're seeing this standard being set by not just the by not just Barnabas, but really the congregation as a whole. But I believe we have Barnabas here to really set the standard, set the example of what was being done in the fact that he took the land, he sold it, he brought the money that he received from it, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. In a very, in the, again, most of the people that were doing this were doing this in a very humble way. They could have been bringing a lot of attention to themselves by saying how much they were giving, and I'm sure there were some that may have acted like this. There were some that probably expected some form of recognition, uh, but we see that, again, Barnabas being this example, it doesn't say any of that. He didn't seek any uh, notoriety for his giving. He didn't receive, he didn't seek any um, anything in return for the fact that he was giving. He, in all humility, had sold that land and laid at the apostles' feet. And again, this was something that a lot of the wealthy Christians at the time were doing. Um, and so many times when movements like this happen in a church where everyone seems to be doing something, everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon. In this case for the church, everybody was selling land and giving money. Everybody was selling things and giving money. Everyone was giving to the apostles to distribute. So there were many that wanted to be like everyone else. They wanted to be similar to everyone else. They were jumping on the bandwagon and, and giving, but not everyone had motives like Barnabas. Not everyone was giving with the right intent, giving for the right reason. And we are going to look at that now as we have our second point of the exposing of the imposters. Exposing the imposters. And we get this from chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It says, But a certain man named Ananias, and with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether he sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? 
Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out also, or carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young man came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. So we see here the impostors, or the ones that are at least talked about here, of Ananias and Sapphira. Um, we see the introduction of this couple who are about to be exposed. Uh, they were a part of this early church and apparently wealthy. They were landowners, um, or at least they were appearing to be wealthy um, because they sold their possessions. They sold this bit of land um, in order to be just like everyone else and bring it to the apostles. Right? Everyone else was selling this land, so Ananias and Sapphira decided, hey, we have a little bit of extra land. Let's sell it and bring the proceeds like everyone else is doing. Um, but we see that they didn't bring the entire proceeds. They, they brought part of it. But they said that they brought the entirety of what they sold it for. So they came up with this scheme with within their hearts, both Ananias and Sapphira, they were both in this together um, and decided that we're going to sell this land. We're going to take the money. We're going to keep some of the money for ourselves, but then let's give the rest to the apostles like everyone else is doing and then tell them that this is what we sold the land for. So we fit in with everyone else of selling the land and giving everything to the church at the time. So as Ananias brings this to Peter, we see Peter having great discernment, and I believe that this is discernment from the Holy Spirit. I believe this is something that was supernatural that the Spirit prompted him with, because really Peter probably wouldn't have had a great idea of what the land was actually sold for. He probably didn't know how much land was even sold. Again, there were several people that were doing this. The church was numbering in the thousands, so it's not like Peter had this great knowledge of, of Ananias and Sapphira and the, the portions of land that they owned, and he could make this deduction that, you know what, I know the piece of property that they sold and should have brought more money than he's giving me. Again, he potentially had no idea really who Ananias and Sapphira were. This could have been one of the first times that he'd actually met them because of the rapid growth of the church. So having this discernment, having, again, what I believe to be supernatural discernment that was given to him by the Holy Ghost for a specific purpose, questions Ananias and asks him, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So this discernment allowed Peter to, to point out to Ananias, you didn't sell this land for this much. You're holding part of this back. And he mentions that Satan had filled Ananias' heart to lie. This was a very clear attack on the early church. Because it wasn't that, that when Peter called out Ananias that he said, why did you lie to me? But rather he said, hath Satan filled thine, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? We see from the very beginning, Satan has always tried to destroy or to derail what God has been doing. From the very beginning, why did he tempt Adam and Eve to try to destroy the creation that God had made? Why throughout early history and even up to the point of Christ's birth, did Satan try to destroy the line in which Christ was to come. Because Christ was the Messiah, he was the Redeemer, the one promised to crush his head. Why, even after Christ was born, did he do things to try to tempt Christ, to get him to sin? Why would he do things to try to destroy the work that Christ was going to do? Because he knew what the outcome was going to be. He knew the promise of the Lord. Now, obviously, we know that, the, that God always prevails. Satan's schemes never work to their fullest, but they can cause great damage. They can cause 
issues. And I would say even throughout history, the examples that we looked at, the fall of mankind was an issue. Right? The, the destruction of all of the baby boys in Israel when Christ was born was a, a sorrowful destruction of human life that was brought about by Satan. So it's not that there aren't points in which Satan seems as if he is winning. He's always constantly attacking, but we know overall God will reign supreme in his perfect plan. But this was a way that Satan was trying to derail the work of which the early church was doing, trying to, from the inside, corrupt and destroy the early church. And he used something good to try to cause an issue within the church. Right? After all, Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira were giving to the church. It wasn't like they were doing something destructive within the church. It wasn't like they were gossiping within the church or causing division within the church, which is why Peter says, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? But Satan knew that if he could start to chip away and make a foothold of selfishness and pride and hypocrisy within the early church, that these things would spread. And as they would spread, they would cause decay. They would cause destruction. And soon enough, the early church would have been filled with selfish, proud hypocrites that would be ineffective witnesses of Christ. So again, this is exactly what Peter points out. He points out the selfishness and the pride and the hypocrisy of Ananias. The fact that he sold the land, but he kept a part back. The fact that he thought he could get away with not giving the full amount, saying he gave the full amount, which is the exact hypocrisy of saying, yes, I gave it just like everyone else did, but still had some in his back pocket that he wanted to hold on to. And Peter even points to the fact that this expectation of giving everything was, was not there. Because look at what he says. In verse 4, While it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. He's basically saying, this land was yours. You didn't have to sell it. Even after you sold it, those proceeds were yours. You didn't have to give them. He could have given the, the portion and said, I want to give a portion of this. But the issue was when he said, I'm giving all of it, but didn't give all of it. It was a partial giving, but yet a lie saying it was a whole giving. And again, the, the pointing out that it, that's not... Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Peter confronts the sin. And in this confrontation of sin, and the fact that he lied to God, pointed out the fact that Ananias, Ananias could fool men. He could have fooled Peter. He could have fooled everyone in that early church in saying that he gave all. But there is no fool in God. And this directly ties into our lives and our service to Christ. We can say that we're giving or we can say that we're serving or we can say that we've given our whole lives to God for the sake of everyone else maybe to recognize, oh yes, that person is serving or that person is giving or that person has given everything to God. But God knows the truth. God knows whether or not we've truly given our lives over to him. God knows whether or not we are sincere of our service. He knows whether or not we truly are giving our all to him. You can look good on the outside, but it's the inside that really matters. It's the inside in which God looks at and God judges. And this is exactly what he's doing here. Because we see that as the sin is confronted, and as it is brought to light, 
that God strikes Ananias dead on the spot. And this caused great fear to fall upon the people, as it should. Because here is someone who, just like everyone else, is giving to the church. And again, I'm sure this wasn't a public display, but rather relatively unknown, but then it was spread by word of mouth that as Ananias gave, he died. So this great fear fell upon the church, and I'm sure that it was spread from the people that were there and spread throughout that he died because he lied. But then comes Sapphira. Three hours later, and Peter confronts her to see if this was premeditated or whether or not just Ananias was the one plotting in his heart to deceive God. We know as we read, but this was not something that Peter would have known at the time. Um, but when Sapphira was also confronted, she lied just as well as her husband did. It was a preconceived act. They had worked together. They had they had schemed together in order to lie to the early church to keep some of that money back. So she too suffered the same fate as her husband and was also struck dead for her sin. And once again, great fear fell on all those who heard. So we see a very, very interesting crossroads and a necessary crossroad for the church here. It's growing at a rapid pace thousands of people persecution has come but they're still going strong and now all of a sudden these potentially rich members of the church or followers of Christ have been struck dead for lying seeming like they were doing good but yet being hypocritically proud and selfish. So what was the purpose? I mean, after all, isn't it a bit extreme what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? I mean, they were just giving to the church. I mean, this was just a, just a little lie. I mean, what did it really affect? I mean, the money was still being given. This little lie couldn't be that bad. Why were they killed? For what purpose did this serve? And the answer to this is, is a multifaceted answer. But the first part is revealed in Peter's confrontation of Ananias. Within his confrontation of Ananias, we see that Satan was the one trying to plant the seeds of corruption in the church. He was the one who planted the lie or planted the, the idea within Ananias' heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. So he was Satan was trying to destroy the church through corruption, through sin. And with the church being in its infant phases, we see that God protected the church through great power and punishment. Because again, remember, great fear fell upon all people. This would have sent the message to the church that there is no room for imposters. There is no room for people who are just along for the ride. This isn't a social movement. This isn't just the club that you can join and give some money to have a membership card. This is serious business. And God wanted everyone to know that in that early church. God wanted everyone to know that he was seeking genuine believers. Genuine believers that were interested in following him. Interested in building his kingdom. He's not looking for selfish, proud, arrogant hypocrites. That think they can lie to God but get away with it because no man knows. He's not looking for people that are looking to build their own kingdom. 
And this is true today. God is still seeking genuine believers. God is still seeking those who are invested in following him and in building his kingdom. Which brings the challenge to us. Are we selfish, proud, arrogant hypocrites seeking to build our own kingdom? Or are we those who are following Christ and invested in following him, seeking his will and not our own? Because God knew the challenges that were going to come to the early church. He knew the importance of the early church. He knew that he needed to make sure that the people that were on board knew the cost, knew the price, knew the purpose. So whereas some may feel that it was extreme that Ananias and Sapphira were, were killed for their lying to God and lying to the Holy Spirit, this served as a strong warning to all those that God means business and he needs you to mean business too. Secondly, we see how serious God takes sin. We see how serious God takes sin. Many would view this as just a little white lie. Just a little lie. After all, who does it really affect? money's still going to the church it'll still be given to people it's not like it's counterfeit money it's not like they're going to go spend it and it's not going to be any good it's a little bit of lie it's a little tiny white lie but God viewed it as a sin worthy of death and in fact any sin is a sin worthy of death because every sin was the sin that brought Christ to the cross even just those little white lies. We far too often treat sin flippantly. We don't see it as God sees it. If we started to see sin as God sees sin, then serious transformation would begin in our lives. If we knew how much sin displeased God, how much sin grieves God, how God views the breaking of his intended law in which he has given us, and we align our lives according to that view, then we're completely different people. And this is something that we should be seeking. We should be seeking to view sin as God views sin. Understanding, as I said before, that every sin, even the smallest one, caused Christ to go to the cross. Necessitated Christ's blood to cover. Was enough to break our fellowship with God. So when we think that it might just be a little white lie, it might just be a curse word that's fairly common and no one would bat an eye. Where it might just be one thing here or one thing there. God views it seriously. We need to view it seriously as well. If we viewed it seriously, we would seek reconciliation immediately. This is how we can view it seriously. Because while we're here on this earth, we won't be able to completely avoid sin. We're still in a fallen world. We're still imperfect human beings. But we can control how often and how quickly we turn to Christ in repentance. If we viewed sin seriously, we would turn immediately for repentance. When we mess up, when we sin, immediately turning and asking for forgiveness. And finally, we see 
that good deeds with the wrong intentions miss the point and miss the mark. Ananias and Sapphira were giving to the church. They were helping the poor. They were doing what many would consider good. But their motive was wrong. It wasn't done to please God. It wasn't done to glorify Him. But rather it was to please man and to glorify self. We need to be very careful that what we, what we do for Christ has the proper motives. That we are serving Christ because we want to please Him. We are serving Him because we want to glorify Him. That we want to treat sin properly because it pleases Him and glorifies Him. Far too often we allow our service to become more of service to ourselves. Whether it is to bring more attention to ourselves, to feel as though we are doing good, to feel as though we are vital to the church, all to bring glory to us. Everyone look at me. Look at how much I'm doing. Look at how well I'm doing it. Instead of humble service, that I'm doing this because I know God wants me to do this. Because it's a way that I can glorify Him. It's because a way I can please Him. There are several lessons for us from this. We just looked at many of them. It was lessons that the early church needed to learn. Fortunately, it was at the expense of Ananias and Sapphira's sin. But we know that Satan is trying to destroy the church from within. That hasn't changed. He's trying to find those who may be susceptible. To find those who may be weak. And he's looking to attack. This is why we have so many warnings within Scripture to stand strong, to put on the armor of God, to stand in the strength of Christ, and not our own. Because we have an enemy. We have one who is looking to devour us. Are you standing strong against Satan's attacks? Are you standing firm in Christ's power and in his word? best way to do that is to be in it. To be in God's Word. To be studying it. To be building ourselves up in the faith. Are we taking sin seriously? Do we view sin as God views sin? Well, Sam, how do I view sin as God views sin? How do I actually get that view? It's right here. In his word. Particularly if you want to view sin as God views sin, start reading the Old Testament. You'll see how God views sin. There are many today that say the Old Testament is not relevant. It's just the New Testament. But we can gain such a clear picture of who God is and what he does and what he likes and dislikes from the Old Testament. So study, read, put in the effort to understand how God views sin. I mean, a great starting point is the fact that sin was so costly that it cost the Son of God's life. If we aren't taking sin seriously, we're leaving ourselves vulnerable to be used by Satan. So stand strong against sin. Seek to overcome sin. When we slip into sin, seek reconciliation, seek repentance, seek forgiveness immediately. Not at the end of the day. Not every Sunday. But every day. It's one of the many blessings 
of being a Christian and having the Holy Spirit is the ability to go to prayer at any point and ask for forgiveness. And finally, how are our motives? How are our motives? Are we seeking to please and glorify God with everything we do and everything we say? Or are we seeking to please man and glorify self? These questions are questions that only you can answer. I can't answer them for you. Your friends can't, your children can't, your parents can't, your pastor can't. There are things that need to be searched in our hearts. And honest time before the Lord, pouring out to Him, seeking His guidance, seeking Him to reveal areas in our lives in which we may be weak. In views in ways we may not view sin seriously, in ways we may have selfish motives in our service. But take that time. Take that effort. It's vitally important. God knew it was important, which is why Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead. Because he knew the importance of genuine, pure believers serving him in the church. Let's seek to be those. Let's pray. Father, just thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for the lessons that we learn from your word. And even though they may not seem right to us, they may not seem fair to us, they may not seem just, and this is where faith in you is so vital and necessary to know that everything that you have done is true and pure and just. As oftentimes our definitions for even those things come from you. Help us in our service for you to not do it to merely please ourselves or to please others, to bring self-glory, but rather to glorify you and to seek you and your kingdom. All right, I also pray that we would view sin seriously as you do. We oftentimes don't want to because it hurts. It's painful. The Lord is necessary. Help us also to stand strong against the attacks of the devil. Stand firm in your word. And may each and every one of us purpose within our hearts that we won't be that weak link. That Satan won't gain a foothold in this church because of me. Lord, as we seek and purpose that and, and commit that to you, pursue that, Lord. We know we'd see blessing from you as we, with our whole hearts, do that. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.